unfortunately for you. <laughs> oh, we're good. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the awesome on the contrary show presented by prize picks. I'm Dave Lochran at Lafay underscore D on Twitter. L O U G H Y underscore D for those of you podcast listeners out there joined as always by Alex Baker, awesome himself and getting the monkey off his back last <laughs> week. Millionaire maker Alex Baker with a full Seattle Seahawks onslaught, including Rashad Penny, which is hilarious because Ben and I on Sunday on the deeper dive were like, man, I don't know if we can go back to Seattle. <laughs> Cue the 50 plus point game with the entire team getting you the million. It's got to feel good, man. What's up, guys? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that was really the thing everyone gets into DFS trying to do is win a million bucks. And it took me a long time, but finally it broke through there. <laughs> Congrats to you, brother. We'll do the awesome hall of fame segment. We might, we might do the hall of fame segment later, depending on how much time I'm trying to get as much content in as possible. All we have is a uh, less than an hour window. We're also joined for the second time this season, an old friend of ours he used to be an integral part here at awesome. O. Kyle Dvorak of NBC Sports Edge at Kyle tweets here on Twitter. What's good, brother? Happy to have you back. Yeah, this is a uh, second time this season. And I don't know, probably like how many shows do you think I did last year? I was doing probably four or five a week for 20 weeks. So I've easily crested the 100 mark. And I did a bunch with Alex. I missed Alex on the contrary last time because you were uh, either honeymooning or getting prepared for the wedding. So you have had a massive glow up, not only... <laughs> Married man, not only finally the Millie Maker winner, but also sexiest D D sexiest man of the year, sexiest DFS player of the year, according to esteemed podcast lulls. So I, I understand that I'm the guest here, but I feel like we have a man of honor here. <laughs> and he has triplets on the way. Is that true? No, not at all. That'd be crazy. <laughs> all right. But uh, yeah, you didn't you guys do the uh, the showdown show together every week last year, too, for th uh Thursday, Thursday night or think, Monday yeah. night football? Yeah. Might have at least one of them, yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. You were you played an integral role, did a lot of fantasy football stuff as well. So we're happy to have you, man. And I mean, Alex, there's no crazier week than week 18, right? Because you have all of these incentives, and we're going to talk about them. Some of them may seem meaningless, you know, it might not seem important, but some of them are, and they're actually pretty easily attainable. Uh, and then you've got a number of teams, mostly two that we'll dive into right now, that don't have anything to play for, not because they're out of the playoffs, but because they've locked up their seed and are going to very likely rest guys for the entire game or at least some of it, which makes them really tough to target. Yeah, definitely. I mean, week 18, it's all about figuring out who, who's motivated. And like sometimes even teams that have been out of it a while, like take a little bit of a different strategy in week 18. So there's definitely the possibility that there's some super landmines this week. I think so too. And, and you know, one thing I was wondering, Kyle, someone actually tweeted me about this and um, Ben, I keep mentioning Ben Rasa. Of course you're familiar with Ben. I've heard uh, of mentioned on Tuesday's show that the giants had negative 10 passing yards last week, which is really a remarkable stat, no matter who your quarterback is, but also that they ran 40 times. Are, are we possibly in a position this week where, you know, bad teams that are already out of it might actually be not incentivized to rest their players for the playoffs, but to just maybe go with a run heavier approach and say, screw it. We're just going to play for a better draft pick. Like, do we have to be factoring in how certain teams who are just absolutely in the cellar are going to, to, to plan the games out and, and, and run their games this week? I don't think tactically they will do that. I don't think they will say, let's play to score fewer points with our in-game decisions but like Ron Rivera has talked about using this game as a chance to see younger players is what he said so I don't think he's going to be like let's punt on third down because it'll get us a better draft pick but I think in the third quarter you know once Antonio Gibson has already hobbled with this hip injury does Jared Patterson come in, in the third quarter like it wouldn't surprise me so I don't think we see teams playing intentionally bad football with their in-game decision making but do I think of all all weeks obviously we would see a deeper rotation for a bunch of teams yeah I think this would obviously be that week not even like you said for obviously like the Packers we're going to see a deep rotation for the Packers right but like Washington's literally said they want to use this game to see younger players I think it was a few years ago Tampa Bay was playing for uh, a really good draft pick I don't know if it's the number one pick or not but in the second half they just benched their starters like they were just like yep let's just bench them as a chance to see our younger players that was a bit more obvious as was obviously Washington and Philly Philly just trying to get a better draft pick 
I think those are on the extreme ends, but with skill position players specifically, like something like the Washington backfield, even like the Giants pass catching core, these types of teams, I think they will uh, probably get more targets going deeper into the pool and carries than normal. I don't think we see anything like let's, I think, I think the Giants just ran 40 times because they literally were throwing for net negative yards, not because they were like, let's like Joe judge is not the type of coach. who's like, we need a better draft pick. He doesn't know anything about draft picks, honestly. Right. But it is crazy. I mean, and, and I'm, I agree oh, it's with hilarious. you, but Alex, it God. is crazy that they ran 40 times in a game that they lost 26 to, or 29 to three. That one was a bit strange because uh, they were uh, missing all their wide receivers in addition to their quarterback. So I guess they just didn't care like to, to pass the ball. But uh, it really depends how many of those wide receivers are back this week, maybe to what we're expecting there. But I'm kind of digging through the game logs last year. And a lot of teams that were out of contention like also played multiple uh, QBs in their games. Arizona was eight and eight last year. You saw uh, Kyler Murray only played like a half. Same with Carolina. I'm kind of going through. It's tough because this year, like some of these teams are in the playoffs or are fighting for something. So obviously that's not going to happen. But uh, it, like I feel like even teams that have been out of it a while sometimes treat week 18 or, or the last week, I should say, like as a different beast. They could be, and and of course you can't forget the infamous one where Doug Peterson was like, "Hey, uh, I don't care if if you guys make the playoffs. You're in my division. I'm just gonna sit Jalen Hurts and all of the starters at the end, and not only actively but obviously tank this game." So yeah, look, I don't blame any team for doing that. Quite frankly, I think you do what's best for your squad, uh, and I guess that what the three of us are gonna try and decipher today. But first, happy to have you guys with us, as always. For those of you who have hung out with us all uh, season, every single Friday for On the Contrary, well, glad to have you close out the year with us. Hit that thumbs up if you enjoy this content. Subscribe to the channel. Thanks, as always, for helping us get well over that 70,000 mark. And if you want to join the channel, hit it down below. See it right there. Get the custom emojis, the free Super Chats each month, the badges, and we'll always prioritize your questions, comments, along with our premium Discord chat. Uh, Clownin, welcome to Team Awesome. I saw that up there. I'm assuming it's from another show, but we'll shout you out here as well because, well, that's what we do. All right, so Kyle, let me ask you one thing out of the gate, right? With the Packers and Bengals, these are the two teams, the two teams on this slate that have essentially locked it up, but no real movement upwards or downwards. They are where they are. It, it Chase could break the all-time rookie receiving single season receiving yard record. I think he needs like somewhere around 45 yards. So you might see him out there a little bit, but we already know that that uh, Joe Burrow isn't going to play. Uh, Joe Mixon is on the COVID-19 list. Don't expect to see him. Uh, and then with Green Bay, I don't know what to expect. So how are you approaching these teams? And are you already keying in on some backups? Yeah, it's interesting. The team you would expect most certainly to not play a single starter for a single snap would be Green Bay. There is 0% chance they can move. The Bengals are actually not eliminated from the one seat. They need a number of things to happen. They're eliminated and, from the one. I know what you're saying, but no, I mean, they're they retreating every that team way. No. to lose. They, so yes, that I can, yeah. I can tell you, I think what they need to have and they can't, and they're all massive upsets too. They're yeah. not just losses. They're, no, massive no, no. they're upsets. all double digit favorites. Yeah. They need Kansas city. Uh, they need new England to win their seed. Cause they would somehow like win a tiebreaker over them. Plus another team to lose Tennessee to lose, obviously. So they're actually treating it almost more like the Packers are more like the Packers should be right. Cause you know, Joe Burrow already ruled out Joe Mixon on the COVID list. I don't think they're not playing him. They also were even cagey if Jamar chase would play at all. I think the, the quote was he could potentially, play so like you said he's playing a quarter going for the record from a dude in like the 60s like bill groman or something i don't know who this person is and inexplicably in the 60s he got like nearly 1500 yards as a rookie it's insane that's it that's the only motivation the team has and even then that's like a very weak motivation for a team that is eyeing a deep playoff run so with i assume it'll be brandon allen under center I can't really imagine playing any of the pass catchers because there's no reason for the team to play any of their pass catchers. Green Bay, as I said, been cagey with how they're going to play. But Devontae Adams, quote from yesterday, maybe the day before, said he doesn't expect to play. So if he doesn't expect expect to play, I can't imagine Rodgers plays. And if they do play, like, what is the benefit? Like, you're never in any scenario getting more than two drives out of these, like two tune-up drives to make sure they stay in rhythm for the playoffs, which they're still going to get the first round by, have plenty of time to prepare. 
Packers are playing Jordan Love as far as I'm concerned. If you lose out on a quarter of Jordan Love or two drives, it is what it is. Like you probably shouldn't have been playing Jordan Love anyways. But hey, the AFC is going to be fun as shit this week. Yeah. I mean, there's I mean, there a are, lot. Like, Go ahead. I, I, it'd be really, I hope the like if the Chiefs lose, it kind of uh, immediately cements a lot of things, which isn't likely, but it could happen. Uh, it's another team that seems like even though they're eliminated, Denver's like, we're going to go out and try and play our hardest to win. So if they win, that pushes Tennessee to play. Uh, that gives, I think it does disincentivize New England, though. Yeah. I, Alex, I, I guess really from a DFS standpoint, and I do, I, I get a lot of action in, from a betting perspective this week, too, because I think there are going to be some, some spots that we should be looking at, uh, especially if you, can, if you can get it right uh, and figure out what the coaches are going to do. But are there any teams right now that you're kind of just not targeting based on one reason or another or, or expected to sit their players or just the overall uncertainty going into the week? Yeah, I think that Green Bay is the team just like uh, – uh, I know, like, maybe we get some more information uh, leading up to this game. But if Aaron Rodgers starts, uh, I find it hard to, to play Jordan Love, even though, like, this is a matchup versus the Lions. So Jordan Love could be pretty successful. And then, uh, if, like, I, I don't really know what to expect. It sounds like they're being pretty transparent about what they're doing. But uh, the matchup's awesome, but we just don't know who's playing. So that one's obvious. Uh, and then with the, the Bengals, like you guys were saying, if Kansas City Kansas City plays on Saturday, so yeah, four thirty. If they win Saturday, like then that kind of locks in their spot, I think. So I right. think um, that's another team where it's it's tough, tough to get to, like especially because they're going to be in the playoffs. Uh, like you can't even really bank on Smash A P, P Ryan like playing a workhorse role or something like that. Yeah, it could definitely be Chris Evans getting a lot of work because yeah. P. Ryan does have a role. Um, we had a question saying can, from Poppy, can we talk about incentives also? You're damn right, fella. We're going to be talking a lot about those incentives because there's actually uh, there's actually some really interesting ones. Uh, so we'll get to all of them. But I actually want to go back and forth with you guys on two spots at the top of the running back and wide receiver position. Kyle, I'll start with you. At running back, you have Jonathan Taylor. Um, I know he needs, he needs like 266 rushing yards to eclipse 2K in, a, in an 18-week season, or sorry, 17-game season. Okay, fine. I'm not really factoring that in, even though if you look at last year, his final game came against Jacksonville, and he ran like 30 for 235 and two touchdowns. But still, he's in a very, very good spot. They're like 15-point road favorites against the Jags team that – could be the lowest scoring team in franchise history. They they're uncompetitive at this point. They've given up. Good, good. But I do want to know, like, how are you? How how do you look at someone like Taylor, just from a tournament standpoint? Because this is on the contrary compared to guys like Dalvin Cook, who said, "Listen, I'm going out there and I'm playing. They've got a great matchup, or at least a good matchup at home." Uh, Alvin Kamara against Atlanta, where they're going to need him. They're not eliminated from playoffs yet against Atlanta. And then, of course, Najee Harris against Baltimore outside. It's very slim, but outside chance uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers as well. Yeah, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, both teams will be playing as if they have a chance to make the playoffs yep. because they do technically. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Although 538 literally gives them like one and half a percent chance of right. making it. But teams, you know, teams interpret that as like we're playing all out. And I gotta do it. You would. Yeah. So I think uh, like. Jonathan Taylor perfectly makes sense. But to me, like you, you point out, there are a ton of other options. Dalvin Cook has motivated himself. Alvin Kamara literally is motivated. All his team needs to do is win and get a San Francisco loss. San Francisco are probably underdogs this week to the Rams, I would imagine. They're four and a half I, point, four, four, four and, and a half, half depending on so, where you look. Yeah. So they're very live to make the playoffs and they are pretty much terrible outside of Alvin Kamara. They have no other talent on this awful, decrepit team, but they've been pushing through it because they have Alvin Kamara and Taysom Hill is at least a unique talent. So I think someone like, uh, you know, Dalvin Cook and Alvin Kamara, even Najee Harris uh, should see like an incredible role of sub zero A dot targets without Deontay Johnson in the lineup, assuming I don't. I don't think he has a, a good shot of making it back to this game. So like, I think there are a lot of stud workhorse backs who either are literally motivated in that their teams can make the playoffs or Dalvin cook says he's motivated. So that's fine too. That would be interesting pivots to get a similar score at a far less price at probably way less ownership. Cause like Taylor intuitively makes sense. He's incredible. He plays the God awful Jags and they need to win to make the playoffs. So it makes an intuitive level of sense. But, like the same thing could be said for Najee Harris. So I, I think Taylor's fine, but I think there are, 
similarly talented players who are going to be far less popular. That's kind of where I'm at too, Alex. I'm curious to see where, where you reside among the top tier running backs, all of whom feels like they have, you know, really big potential to, to blow up here, but obviously Jonathan Taylor in a phenomenal spot, huge favorite. Like if he had 200 rushing yards, I don't think any of us would be shocked. It's just that price point is where I'm, I'm curious to see where you stand uh, especially since you created the boom bust tool, which kind of gives us a lot of those answers, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that uh, Jonathan Taylor is obviously a good play. So we just kind of kind of look at like how good of a play he is compared to the salary and the other options. So we have the optimal percentage to, to really capture that, which is based on our simulations. So we have him as about a 24 and a half percent chance of being in the optimal lineup this week, and that's the second highest on the slate. So definitely one of the top plays. Okay, who did you say? Oh, Taylor is? Yeah. Who's yeah. first high? Who's most? So we have Antonio Gibson at the highest. Uh, so just because of the price point at 5,800, there aren't a lot of cheap running backs this week that you can really mm-hmm. bank on. So that's, uh, that's what we're thinking. Yeah, Kyle, we have Dalvin Cook around 16%. Uh, <laughs> Wow, we have Kamara pretty low, huh? <laughs> Where's Kamara? Yeah, that doesn't. <laughs> what did you say? I, that is, a, that is a good answer on how low him. owned is he. I don't know, but I don't see him. <laughs> That's not good. That disappoints me. Well, I think uh, Najee Harris is really interesting. Like Kyle was saying, with uh, with uh, Deontay Johnson out, he got 19 targets that one game he was out. So, like, that's a lot more targets and Alvin Kamara is going to be getting with Taysom Hill <laughs> playing. That's true. Yeah. And Ben can't throw more than two yards downfield anyway. How many catches is Najee Harris going to uh, catch on fourth down specifically short of the sticks by 11 yards? <laughs> yeah. It's the most unbearable thing to watch. It's horrible. It's <laughs> awful Pittsburgh offense get to third and 11 and just dump it off to anyone. They do it with other players too. It's disgusting, but it's great for Najee. Like he is going to catch so many third down dump offs. It, it's truly dreadful. I mean, Ben averaged 2.7 yards per attempt on 46 <laughs> attempts last week. How does that even happen? The worst part of this is that we can't even treat this like a retirement game for Ben because if they win, they have the potential of playing <laughs> another game. So I don't think we're going to get a, a clear retirement game. No, I, I honestly, I hope we don't. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't you know what I pray game. every night since uh you know the end of last week happens is that pittsburgh uh appears to make the playoffs the jags pull off the upset uh pittsburgh wins their game and then the final game of the night ends in a tie and they don't get in because pittsburgh does not deserve to get into the playoffs (laughs) they really don't but you know what's crazy if they didn't tie detroit like they probably have if they didn't tie detroit wouldn't they probably be favored to get into the playoffs or at least a lot more than one percent yeah, they might they might be in a much more tiebreaker scenario with uh, with the Colts as opposed to the Colts just need a win and get in scenario. Yeah, it's crazy. The Steelers are eight, seven and one. They'd be nine, nine, they'd seven, be nine and seven. Nine, yeah, nine, nine, seven. And uh, that's where all of the teams playing for. Yeah, it'd be a really weird tiebreaker scenario. That's where all of the teams it's crazy. Uh, like Chargers, Raiders, Colts are all sitting at. So I'm sure there'd be some disgusting tiebreaker scenarios. Yeah, that'd be four teams at nine and seven. That's wild. Um, Hey, we had two super chats. Alex Scarecrow says, does it make it more important this week to choose the right game versus the right players, given the uncertainty of who we will play? That's an interesting question. Yeah, uh, I think that that's a good point that maybe stacking up a game is in play. Although uh, I think that you could also stack up teams against a team that has nothing to play for. Like if you wanted to roll with the Lions or something. So I don't necessarily think you need to, to stack a game, but uh, I think that I, I think also choosing the right players is going to be really important. So uh, I, I think that your safest bets are guys that are, are playing for something because there's just no chance they're going to rest. Some of the teams with a little to play for, it's a little bit of a wild card. So um, you, you got to kind of try to read into each situation. Kyle, do you think you might have less game stacks this weekend? And let me just preface this by saying, uh, I ask it because there is one game with a total of 48 outside of that. 
it's ugly, man. There's a couple 44s, a lot of 40s, a lot of like 41s. It isn't to say that these games can't still pop off, but just looking at it, like zooming out with a 30,000 foot view, there aren't exactly a lot of games where you go, okay, you know what? This has a decent total, but one, but, but both teams are actually live to put up big numbers. You know, you get the Colts, but then they're facing the Jags. You got Tennessee against the tight, uh, the Houston Texans, and then just a lot of other really strange spots. So do you approach this slate differently in that respect, or do you play it how you always would? Yeah, I think this one is one where I'm much less likely to run it back, and I'm more likely to play a running back, as we saw with Alex's winning lineup, a running back with his quarterback. That also would have been that also would have been great for the Patriots last week, who you could have literally played both of their running backs plus their passing attack. Uh, you would have had to have played practice squad call up Christian Wilkerson, which definitely wasn't tilting as someone who played a lot of Mac Jones stacks uh, to not know Christian Wilkerson was even an NFL player. But I think knowing that there are specific teams that one there are like good teams against a ton of bad teams. Those bad teams are unmotivated, probably looking to look deep into the rotation. And they weren't like, we weren't playing the Jag starters, let alone imagine them. I don't even know what their fifth wide receiver is at this point. I don't want to know. So if I'm playing cold sack, I'm totally comfortable running, uh, you know, Carson Wentz plus Jonathan Taylor. Uh, Taylor's pretty expensive. He needs a lot to get there. So that one would need a real tail end event. But something like New England, New England's passing attack is relatively cheap. Their running backs also are quite good. So I'd be much more likely to stack up very heavily one offense and not even care about bringing it back. What about you, Alex? Would you be looking at like a t- a Tannehill plus AJ Brown plus Dante Foreman or, or any other spots that that you could just go on slot like you did last week without a run? Did you run? You did run back Amon Ross St. Brown. Yeah. But yeah. um, but just from from this week, is there anything you're doing differently? I think it will be a game specific thing, like uh, with uh, a team that's facing a team that might be pulling starters or something like that. Then. The onslaught makes a lot more sense where maybe there's just not many one on the field for the other team and there's no good option. So I think the, the run back is usually a good correlation, but uh, there are some more exceptions this week than than uh, an average NFL week. OK, uh, and then one more super chat here, Kyle, I'll go to you. Oh, well, thanks, Sammy he said you guys help me out every week. More ears and less flap. Is that Mark Giordano? I guess he's referring to you, Kyle, Mark Giordano. I believe that's yeah. a ho- hockey it is, player. It is a hockey player. I think at some point he played for Calgary. I believe that's correct. Anyway, no, that is not hockey. Mark Giordano. But thank you for the super chat, Sammy. Uh, <laughs> here's one. That's decrepit offense, not decrepit team. Peyton should be coach of the year if Saint makes the play- Saints make the playoffs. Eh. That's fair. No, that's fair. They, you know, mounted a good defense. Yeah, they're decrepit Agreed offense. Disagree. I concede. Agree to disagree. I mean, the defense is, they're good, but I don't know. Either way, thanks for the super chat, man. <laughs> is that, right, is that, was that the whole super chat? Yeah, yeah, he was just correct, I guess. But he, he listen, gave us a super chat to do it. So all good, man. You can say whatever the hell you want. All right, Kyle, similar question with the wide receivers up top, right? We talked about Taylor, Cook, Kamara, Najee. I think we got some pretty good thoughts on that. What about with, with Cup? You have him, I mean, you want to talk about incentives. It's more milestones, but, you know, 12 receptions can get in the record. He even said, like, it should be, this should be new records. It's not the same. Um, He needs a bunch of yards to get to 2,000 or to break the all-time receiving record, but it's it's in somewhat in reach. Either way, very expensive. Doesn't even matter. The guy's a monster. You know, every single week you get good production from him. But then you have guys like Justin Jefferson against Chicago this week. Uh, Debo Samuel, and then a couple of other high-priced options. Are there any good, uh, comparably priced guys, not really comparably priced, but good wide receivers at the top tier that you think could be strong pivots? Or is this like Cooper Cup has got to be a guy that we're targeting heavily? Yeah, I don't have a problem targeting Cooper Cup. I don't think he's like too far off from 1946, as I believe the Calvin Johnson number. I think he's like 150 away. It's a large number, but it's not something we've not seen Cooper Cup do. Oh, he can definitely do it. Uh, he's, it's crazy. He's not even close. He's had a really good touchdown year and he's not even close. There are a lot of really good touchdown scores. Uh, I think so looking at, uh, I almost said our, as if I still work here, looking at your guys' ownership projections, Debo Samuel, it looks like he's trending more towards being a wide receiver again, which, you know, 11 targets two weeks ago, six targets last week, uh, still getting the rushing work. At, you know, I don't, I don't really care about the rushing work. I get that he's been efficient, but like, can you really project him to score a touchdown every single game on the ground? I'd much rather him just 
get 10 targets. And with Elijah Mitchell back, they're not really incentivized to use him as a running back as much anymore. And it's a must win game. They should be getting Jimmy Garoppolo back as well. If your guys' ownership projection holds and he's like sub 5%, even if he's like sub 10%, really like Debo's like, you know, his weighted opportunity was leading the league early in the year. And then it scaled back because they literally had to play him at running back. So if we get super elite Debo with a normal quarterback back, I like Trey Lance, but for fantasy purposes, I'd rather have Jimmy Garoppolo. He's gotten limited practices back to back. So he should be playing this week versus uh, the Rams in a game where both teams are incentivized to play. Obviously, San Francisco, they just need a win and they're in, and they can't know if they don't need a win uh, because Saints play simultaneously. And the Rams are still playing for seeding. I believe they just need a win to secure the number two seed as well, which multiple coaches have talked about that actually being important to them because it gives you home field advantage through, at minimum, the NFC Championship for the Rams. Incentivized Debo Samuel playing a full-time wide receiver role seems like just a complete smash. Yeah, the Rams can lock that up, uh, lock up the division, like you said, uh, in the two with that win. So that's yeah, big. they're very volatile too because they could go from being the number two seed to not even winning their division. So they yeah. are re- they're not just flipping like you know the Cowboys are I think flipping between like the two and four seed, right? It's not that much for them. They said they're playing to win, but it's at a least- guaranteed home game in round one too. Yeah, yeah. So, but the Rams can really flip between I guess at least minimum the two and five seed. They can jump out of that top four because they don't have their own division locked up. Yeah, and they could go from playing a home game to like prop potentially all road games, which would not be yeah. fun at all. Um, Alex, what do you think about that? And yeah, like Kyle pointed out, Garoppolo turned in back to back limited practices. He was airing the ball out like 40 yards downfield, too, and they said he looked pretty good. So I- I'm assuming that, that he's probably going to play along. I think Eli Mitchell plays this week as well. So they should be back to close to full strength. Where do you go at the top of the wide receiver position? And, and how much Cooper Cup do you think we should be getting to this week at 9,700 on DraftKings specifically? Yeah, I think that Debo Samuel is someone I, I want to have, but I'm finding it a little bit tough to get there. Uh, I think that with George Kittle being back, his target share has dropped uh, in addition to him not playing all of his snaps at wide receiver. But like he's been so phenomenal this year, it's hard to not – want to have him but then you look at cooper cup and the the projection is like nearly seven points higher with twelve hundred dollars more or or you can go down a little bit and get Diggs and justin jefferson so uh i think cup is a good option but uh it's a slate where there's not a ton of value as of now so i'm i'm fine with fading him at his current price and maybe spending down for the the next tier of wide receivers like Stefan Diggs, uh, Justin Jefferson, and and some other guys. Speaking of Stefan Diggs, Kyle, we got some incentives to talk about. I got the big ones listed here. Let's have some fun with this for a minute. Yes, it may seem like it's more for entertainment purposes for us, but it's kind of not. Like there are actually some spots here that guys could make some decent money, and I think there are some quarterbacks that might look to get them there. They know about these things too. Like we saw last year, obviously Antonio Brown, not on the roster anymore, but Brown needed like 11 catches in the final game to get get, 15. Yeah. He he got absolutely crushed with targets and got to 15. And yeah, he got, I think well over what he needed. And it wasn't like that much money for Antonio Brown, like super elite receiver who I'm sure made tens of dozens of millions with Pittsburgh. It was like maybe a hundred thousand dollars and he got absolutely peppered with targets. These are definitely things players know about and like strive to get. How sick is it though that we look at this and it'll be like, you know, it's only five hundred thousand, right? Like, but it is. <laughs> Alex it, winning his milli is like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'd go out and catch eleven <laughs> balls right. for just a five hundred thousand. Right. But we're wired to look at it that way. It's like, oh, what's his? Co- oh, he's only making five. He's only making a half a mil. Yeah. But okay, so AJ Green, ten receptions could net him two hundred and fifty thousand, and then if he adds seventy-five yards, it gets him to nine hundred yards. That's another two hundred and fifty k. So that's half a mil. Stefan Diggs needs six receptions for, and this is an interesting one, right? Because it's like, at, at, what do they call them? Elevators, contract elevators or whatever it is. Escalators. Escalators. Thank you. They both go up though. <laughs> <laughs> they both. Oh, they, really? I'm just saying man. <laughs> I should start something new, but yes, escalators is the, is the right term. Uh, 750,000 in 2022. And then it would be another 800,000 in 2023. If he gets six receptions, he needs a ton of yards to get over a certain yardage mark, but there's that. And then Gronk, I haven't seen this one talked about as much, but he needs seven receptions for 500 K 
85 yards for another 500 K and then three touchdowns for another 500 K. And then lastly, you guys can add to him if you know of any more Rex Burkhead needs 103 total yards for 125 K, which to him probably pretty significant money, right? So, uh, Alex, any of these stand out to you as very much achievable incentives for guys that you already liked, but might like a little bit more now. Well, the digs one, we haven't projected for six catches. So I don't think that really moves the needle a ton uh, for me. True. The Gronk one, though, I think that um, he's been hustling, man. He did karaoke. He did uh, parties uh, at he the, did the USAA Bowl. commercial, which everybody yeah. loves. He, he's been hustling to try to make more money. So maybe he's got that drive. <laughs> but <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, he actually is a good play, too, because with Antonio Brown and, and, um, Godwin. and Godwin out – that's just a lot more target share because uh, Mike Evans isn't the highest target share guy. So I think him and, and Evans both get a big bump there. And let's be fair with Fournette out too. Like Fournette's yeah. target share had been absurd lately. So yeah, I hear you. What about you, Kyle? Any of these stand out to you? Yeah, the I, I actually, of all of them, I thought the argument for Burkhead was the most interesting only because it probably means the most to him. Uh, right. Whereas like these other guys are making significantly more money than they need to. And I pulled up uh, Anthony Miko on Twitter and we, it looks like we covered the most of them. Uh, Tom Brady has a few incentives for like being top five in passing yards, touchdowns, and then, like some efficiency stuff. So we covered the the bulk of them though. Yeah. The, the Tom Brady one is weird because it's like, he's so far out of it, I think on a lot of those, but I don't know, Kyle, doesn't it kind of feel like you could see an all out aerial assault from the Tampa Bay bucks this week, get Mike Evans, thousand, get Gronk his incentives. Maybe Brady can accomplish some of those passing uh, th- as if him and Giselle need the money, but you get the point. I, They're also I, like really banged up at running back right now. Really banged up. Yeah, I mean, like Keyshawn Vaughn's fine, but there, I don't think there's any way Ronald Jones plays this week. No, no. He was in a walking boot earlier this week, yeah. and they're not playing for a ton. And they uh, they can, again, flip seeds. But funny enough, they can almost only play the Eagles because as they flip, uh, the Eagles also move up and down. So I think 75% of the time really? they play the Eagles. Yeah. What if the Eagles win or lose and the, and the Bucks win? It still doesn't matter? It's not that it doesn't matter, but I think like if you, if you just run uh, like – compute the odds basically it's 75 percent chance because mostly it's based on the eagles when the eagles win they knock the they knock dallas down and they go up which flips them to tampa bay and if they lose they push dallas up and tampa bay down which flips them to tampa bay so it's not it's not set in stone but they can't even really choose their opponent obviously they can't get a first round bye, but uh like i don't see a ton of reason for them to rush any of their running backs back i think giovanni bernard is eligible to come back this week i'm not even sure he would but like can we be can we be targeting this Tampa offense? Cause I'm really tempted to just go full out Tampa stack. Yeah. Bruce Arians was actually one of the coaches that was most confident. Although like these coaches are consummate liars, but he was the most, he, I think he was the one who actually said like, we're playing our starters. Like it was no, no right. doubt about it. We're playing our guys. And uh, I think they at least have a little more incentive to, as opposed to obviously a team like green Bay who says the same thing, but I just don't believe it. Alex, what about you for the Bucks offense? Because our top stack tool, and this could change, obviously, just based on any coach speaking or just getting reports throughout the week. But we have them with the, one of the highest top stack probabilities, but very little uh, quarterback ownership going to Brady. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a little bit confused by this Eagles thing, to be honest. But Me too. Uh, I think that, um, okay, so if the Rams won and the Bucks lost, then – uh or do i have this backwards where like they're both 12 and 4 so i feel like that affects the seating too um so there there is some seating in play here uh and they should yeah, be bucks still have seating in play they don't have opponent in you know it's like 25 percent chance they change their opponent they still have seating so if them dallas and the rams all or them them dallas and the rams all get the number two seed tied Dallas wins it via, I think, divisional record tiebreaker. And if them and the Rams get it, it is the Rams via head-to-head. So I think they want to only face Dallas or something. I'm not even sure if they're even live for the number two, actually. Okay, so uh, I guess this is like, is there a sign that they're going to rest guys or not? So if there's no sign, I think that we just play this one. 
uh, straight up. And it seems like Evans and, and Gronk are, are very solid plays. So I think the stack would, would definitely be in play. Would you be running it back? Same question I ask every week. Uh, would you be running it back with, with DJ Moore? <laughs> I think so. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to look at this, this uh, box score from last year. And uh, Carolina ran out three quarterbacks uh, in this game. Philip Walker, Teddy Bridgewater started, then P.J. Walker and Tommy Stevens, who I, I didn't even know who that is. But uh, <laughs> isn't that the, like a tight end? <laughs> in in, uh, in this game, D.J. Moore did play 52 of 62 snaps. So um, this is also the Matt Rule last game in Carolina. Is that right? So, like, I don't know if there's going to be any sort of incentive for uh, – Wait, he hasn't, it, been, he hasn't been fired yet, although it is uh seems like it could be heading. I think that the way. writing's on the wall. So I think like maybe if they like have a big performance, would he like get oh, a Matt, Matt chance Rule's of definitely being playing for his job for sure. Okay. So I, I guess DJ Moore definitely like all of the data suggests he's a great play. Uh the target share uh is high. And with Sam Darnold on their center now, there's gonna be more passing plays and the Bucks are a, a passing funnel. So I think all the factors are really looking good for DJ Moore. Um, and uh, he's a great one-off uh, or a run back. So I think he, he's a good play this week. It pains me to say it, but I agree. And <laughs> uh, there's one spot where I'm going to have a tough time justifying a run back, but maybe you guys can convince me otherwise. Um, Kyle, the Buffalo Bills, huge favorites at home in Buffalo against the Jets who – Listen, right now, it's not looking good for Braxton Berrios. Uh, Elijah yeah. Moore is also, they, they said, trending south. So <laughs> that's not good. Uh, they're just like using all these terms for these guys. Uh, and then I don't know what's going on with Jamison Crowder. Michael Carter is also on the injury list. Like, they're in some trouble here. So who do you even, Braxton Berrios was the one guy that we could, you know, have some confidence in. But what do you do with Buffalo, and are you running it back? Buffalo has the highest top stack probability in our top stack tool this week, by the way, which is free, too. Top stack tool. Sorry, quickly, because we have an amazing amount of go- – all of our, like, best tools are free today. NFL top stacks tool, NBA ownership projections, and NHL player rankings. So check them out. You don't need an account. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, so it really depends on what talent they have, if it, as if any of these players are like supremely talented. Uh, James Crowder most recently got in a limited practice. If they have no Braxton Berrios and no Elijah Moore, obviously no Corey Davis before them, that is a lot of targets to go around. Like, it's a lot of targets, and that's about all you can say for James Crowder, who I've said should get a lot of targets before. And, uh, you know, maybe he does and doesn't do a lot with them. I feel like it's the DJ Moore situation, except DJ Moore is obviously more talented. Like, all, I, I need to get it tattooed on my face. Like all the factors are pointing in the right direction. And yeah. stat line every week below <laughs> five for 40 and no touchdowns, but like, it's true. And those are the things we chase because more often than not, people think about it in the way I talk about it. And they're like, he hasn't produced in three weeks. I can't play him like seven targets is a lot for a receiver, but it's not a big sample. And if we can project seven, eight, nine targets for Jameson Crowder, yeah, I'd probably run him back. Michael Carter, if he plays, would also be a really interesting option. He's like this team's Najee Harris, just like no talent at receiver at this point, but still has to pass every single play because they're always losing. Yeah, he'd probably be in line for a ton of targets. All right. Benny said, I just realized Alex isn't wearing denim. Do you, denim? Do you wear denim? <laughs> uh, I don't know how he would know that. But yeah, <laughs> uh, as a YouTuber, like you don't really have to put on real pants. I got some... Uh, some Adidas uh, joggers on. <laughs> Dude, it's a sweet track jacket, though, man. I do Thanks, like man. that. To be honest, it's solid. Uh, Alex, what are you doing with Buffalo and the run back if you're running something back? Assuming, like Kyle said, that Crowder plays. Because if Crowder doesn't play I, and all of those guys are out, I, I mean, are you really, do you really want to go to Keelan Cole <laughs> or like back to the well with a Jeff Smith if he's even still on this roster, a Denzel Mims? It's ugly. Jeff, Jeff Smith played 97% of saps last week. Oh, God, don't do <laughs> but, this. Uh, yeah, I think uh, – okay, so Buffalo, uh, they obviously want to win this one. So I think that uh, Diggs and Beasley are, are your go-to options there. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders is most likely going to be back this week. But 
he is the first week off of the COVID list and he missed uh or was it injury? I'm a little fuzzy, but uh, he, I believe he was injury. It was the other guys who were COVID list players. Okay. Yeah. So he's coming off an injury. Uh, I think he's fine, but uh, I think um, so. Diggs and Beasley and Knox, I think, are solid. Or Devin Singletary has been getting a workhorse role. I don't think there's any reason that would change except to throw up big. So I think those are all good plays. On the Jets, uh, we did see earlier today Berrios and um, Elijah Moore are unlikely to play this week. So Crowder, if he does play, he's the only guy that has a high target share on the Jets uh, among the re- remaining guys. So his uh, target share this year has been 17%. <laughs> That's not exactly great, but uh, if you look at the rest of the guys, Mims is at 12%. Cole's at 14%. Smith is at 12%. Um, Tyler Croft is at 13%. So I, I think it's hard to really have any faith in these guys. Uh, but the targets have to go somewhere. I guess um, Jeff Smith is probably your best bet. Mims didn't play last week, and I don't think he was injured. So uh, Jeff Smith uh, seems to be the guy getting the work. Uh, we're side in, as we're well in as, deep now as well as uh keelan cole so those would be the two guys and then um croft didn't play last week but he played 96 percent of the snaps the week before so he's going to be out there a lot um or you could maybe play for michael carter to get a ton of targets i think there's some value here uh, all right well I know our viewers are sick of me saying this, but it'd be a lot worse if I had been wrong and not right about it each week, continuing to go back to the well with Devin Singletary, who's now playing like 80 plus percent of snaps, even with Zach Moss on the field. I don't know, Kyle, if this ends up being one of those games where Josh Allen and uh, Stefan Diggs and Cole Beasley and Devin Singletary all have big games, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, they're finally using Singletary like the lead back that I think he probably should have been used as over the past couple of years. He has 20 plus carries in two or three games. And the only one that he doesn't over that stretch, he had six targets. I mean, he's actually been good. He's getting the work inside the the red zone. Um, And somehow he's only priced at six K as a 16 and a half point home favorite against the jets. Yeah, the Jets, I believe, also give up the top five most running back carries. Not surprising. You lose a lot of games, teams run against you, but also top five running back receptions. Like, running backs just get there against the Jets in whatever way they choose to do so. I think, like, I'd actually be a little more interested, uh, I don't mean to allude to pivots, but, like, in a, in a Devin Singletary over Antonio Gibson, because both of them have like, you know, fourth quarter pull risk, uh, but one of them plays for the Bills, who should score a lot of points. And the other one is probably going to see Taylor Heineke pulled for Kyle Allen. That sounds awful. So to me, if you're looking for cheap-ish, it's not like, you know, stone cheap, but if you're looking for cheap-ish volume, I like Devin Singletary over some of the other more questionable guys. Like I even, I like him over, uh, you know, Samaj P. Ryan, who I don't know how much he's priced. I do think he got priced up beyond like the 4K minimum or whatever. For sure. Jets have also allowed the most rushing touchdowns in the league as well. So it's, it's, it's a good spot. Who are your favorite options for, for Buffalo, Alex? Well, I think Diggs, obviously. Uh, the incentive is kind of cool, but uh, a good play anyway. And then Singletary uh, versus the Jets. I think that most likely they're going to run the ball a lot, and he's been getting most of the carries. Shout out to our sponsor, Prize Picks, as well. They're doing big things over there, and uh, – Really some, you want to talk about incentives. I'll give you an incentive. Not only do they have a hundred dollar first match deposit bonus when you sign up using the promo code AWESOMO, they're a daily player prop contest with any sport you can think of where you 10 X your money. If you hit five of five in a lineup, you still two X. If you hit four or five uh, in a lineup, unlike traditional books where, you know, four or five legs ain't going to net you much. Uh, if anything, uh, you three X or three, three of five, you still make some money back. I mean, seriously, a great way to build your bankroll, but also have some shots to hit those GPP style wins. You can do cross sport entries. So if you know football and basketball and other maybe niche sports, you can mix them all into the same lineup. All of that is great. But like I said, hundred dollar first match deposit bonus. When you sign up using the promo code awesome, A W E S E M O, but that's not the best part. 
if you sign up using the link in the description or the one that our producer Tyler is about to throw in the chat right now or already did, not sure, I'll uh, give him the benefit of the doubt, you will get a free month of Awesome O Plus Platinum, $90 value. That's our ownership projections, top stack tool, boom bust tool, uh, lineup builder. You can get the Fantasy Cruncher add-on as well. All of our tools, all of them built by this guy right here, Awesome O himself. Uh, you will love them. I promise you, they're awesome tools. But so many people win so much money using these tools and you get it entirely for free for the full month just by signing up at Prize Picks using that link. So, I mean, seriously, take advantage of it. You'd be, it'd be an ill-advised decision to let this pass you by. And well, we'll hit you up in 24 to 48 hours, get you that free month of Awesome O Plus Platinum. And of course, again, use the promo code Awesome O to get a $100 first match deposit bonus. You're getting set up beautifully here. Uh, and obviously we have our free player props tool to help you win over there. And Odd Shopper also free to help you make the best decisions over at Prize Picks. PrizePicks.com, download it in the App Store, Google Play Store, wherever you want. Get your free month. And of course, Use that promo code. And if you're already signed up at Prize Picks, we got two promos that end today at Awesome. Uh, 2022, 2022 gets you 22 days for $20. Every single thing on the site, every sport, every tool, you name it. Or you want to make a legitimate investment, use the promo code HAPPY22, 20% uh, off the entire year. If you're looking to really do something big in the DFS space, make an investment and commit to it 20% off the entire year of Awesome o Plus, every tool we have included. If you go to awesome.com slash promos, you just have to click the button. You don't even need to type in the promo code. So check them out. They're done today. Get in on that if you're already over there uh, and signed up at Prize Picks. All right, let's go to um, let's go to Niners Rams, Kyle. It looks like Jimmy G probably plays. It looks like Eli Mitchell should be back. It is kind of remarkable, right, how a guy in Shanahan, we've had so little faith in him to keep going back to the same guy. But every time Mitchell has gone out and injured or whatever it was and then comes back, Shanahan just goes straight back to him as his bell cow. Yeah, it was hilarious. The first game back, too, uh, he'd been out for a while, and I think it's like three or four weeks, both with a concussion and a knee injury. And he came back and immediately saw like 20-some-odd carries. And they did not, the first game back, I believe he out-touched Jeff Wilson like, 23 to nothing like he's just super elite usage on an offense that no matter who is under center who is like the running back of the team is hyper efficient at running the football makes a ton of sense uh what is he priced this week i feel like i know on fandal he got priced up immediately who, last week mitchell you said yes he's a uh, six thousand flat on DraftKings. oh yeah like just play that play that dude over over Antonio Gibson. Like, I, I don't, again, I'm alluding to the fades. And I know the, uh, the um, boom bust probability was really, uh, really in on Antonio Gibson. And like, intuitively, it makes sense. They're big favorites. They play a team that cannot sustain a single drive. It's terrible. But like, there is a very real chance that he goes out and just straight up gets pulled within the first half. Like, I think that's what I'm playing for. Not that I think he is, if he plays a full four quarters, he probably does bury me. But there are players with more incentives to play for who are not injured, not playing in a game that is completely vile that I'd rather play Mitchell among them. Yeah, so for you, this is Ron Rivera potentially pulling his starters, which is your biggest, that's the, the biggest factor for you in Gibson is what you're saying, not the skill or the matchup. Yeah, not the skill, not the matchup. They do also have not like a great implied team total. Like uh, you look at Sony Michelle is around the same price, higher implied team total. Uh, Mitchell's team total is probably close as is Devin Singletary's obviously an incredible team total. So you're also not like if he captures a lot of the team's touchdowns, but the team reaches their median projection you're not gaining, like you're, you're probably not live to score like a three or four touchdown game. So, I mean, he's perfectly fine, but I think there are outs to him failing that you could probably argue against, you know, a Mitchell having. Yeah, Alex, Eli Mitchell right now, uh, around 7% projected ownership. What do you make of him and Sonny Michelle on the other side of this game? Uh, well, Eli Mitchell, I mean, I think that the workload is there running. Uh, they don't pass a ton to, to running backs in San Francisco, uh, so that's a little bit of a knack against them. His target share is only 13.6% so far this year. Uh, and then he didn't even run very many routes last week, only on one-third of plays. So um, I, I think he's a, a sleeper. I don't feel great about the price tag especially with Sonny Michelle being on the other side and he's the same price as a, a favorite and a spot where um, he's competing for touches with Cam, Cam Akers, but Cam Akers has been out all season due to injuries. So I don't expect that to be a huge factor until we see otherwise. So I think that um, 
Sonny Michelle is one of the top running backs of the week in the same game. And maybe Elijah Mitchell, you could play like as leverage for a stat, but I think that uh, the odds of him hitting are, are pretty low. Um, what are you doing, Kyle, with the, the passing attack for the Rams this week? We obviously Cooper Cup is is it's a foregone conclusion. Like if you're stacking the Rams, you're gonna want to get Cooper Cup in there. But what about some of these auxiliary guys, Higby, Van Jefferson, Odell Beckham, who early in the season we were just getting some great stacking games with them. And recently it's kind of tailed off a bit. Matthew Stafford just throwing a lot of picks. He's been a pick six machine in recent weeks. <laughs> Can we go back to the well against the San Francisco secondary that has really shown some holes? Yeah, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, interestingly, none of these guys have really had massive ceiling outcomes. I don't think Odo that's Beckham what I'm saying. Hit. Yeah. Odo Beckham hasn't, I don't believe ever hit hundred yards with the Rams, but he has scored uh, right now. Actually, this is a really dumb incentive, but he could match his touchdown total in his entire time with Cleveland in his first eight. I believe it's eight games with the Rams with two scores in this game. I don't know Wait, if he knows say that, that again. I, he could score as many touchdowns in his first eight games. I think it's eight games with the Rams as he did in his entire time in Cleveland, like two Get some the years fuck out of here. Yeah. Cause he scored no touchdowns this year and like two the year before <laughs> that. Crazy. And then he had the one season that was shortened by the ACL. I believe it was ACL tear. So yeah, a two score game and he scores as many touchdowns in his first, I think it's eight games with the Rams. I don't think he knows this one, but like you look at Tyler Higby, like I, his season high is 15 points. This guy's terrible. Jesus. Uh, but with the receivers, I think, at least have tangible upsides, especially if they have, like, two long catches, three long catches, which isn't insane to think. It's also not a ton. Uh, you know, I don't think they're very live for that. But if we see, finally, the Odo Beckham 100 yards and a touchdown, like, he hasn't had under 100, 100 yards yet, that would be a ceiling outcome. I do think it, like, for Odo Beckham and even Van Jefferson, 5,800 and then 97 for Cup, like, how much passing production do you need for this team to go off? That's uh, 1,500 some or 15,000 salary for just the pass catchers alone. It seems like that's a lot of money to dedicate to an offense that isn't like, you know, Buffalo leading the slate with implied team total. Hit that thumbs up if you haven't done so yet. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us on a Friday morning and uh, subscribe to the channel too. While you're at it, Follow Kyle at Kyle Tweets here. Check out all of his work at NBC Sports Edge. You got anything else going on that I haven't mentioned yet? Uh, you can check out the motivation tracker. I just, I'll have it, I'll pin it to my Twitter just for every team's motivation to play and quotes from the coaches, uh, which are mostly lies, but I'll call out their lies if they are lies. Uh, so check that out. It's like a big thing I have going this week, just trying to keep tabs on which teams actually care. I like it. Follow Alex at awesome ODFS, myself at Lafayette underscore D while you're at it. And hey, shout out our boy Tyler Xander for producing today's show. We love Tyler around this way. Uh, all right, Alex, a couple more things before we get out of here. We'll give our top. Uh, do I have anything? Am I up against anything, Tyler? If I go like two or three minutes over, we're good, right? All right, because we started a little late. Um, Alex, kind of a strange question, but we have a lot of teams with really low totals. We already talked about the Jets, so we don't need to go there. Um, Giants, we talked about the Bengals, like Giants, Texans, Jaguars. We talked about the Panthers. Are there any other low total teams that you actually think have some respectable plays? Maybe a like Brandon Cooks this week, who is another thousand yard receiver. This guy deserves way more credit than he gets. And everyone should agree with me on that. Uh, or like a Rex Burkhead or maybe a Saquon Barkley for the Giants. Any of these low total kind of trash teams that you say, you know what? Maybe there is one or two good options there. Uh, Atlanta, I think. Uh, I know, like, uh, I've probably recommended them every week, but this is I the week. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, okay, so they're facing New Orleans, a team that's pretty incentivized to win. Um, and Kyle Pitts said he's going to play this week, which I thought he might not because of that in hamstring injury, but I guess it's not that, that bad if he's not missing any time. Then Russell Gage, uh, these guys are, are both reasonable targets. I think it's one of the teams where uh, they pass a lot and you don't have to really be worried about that. So I think that Atlanta is pretty nice. Miami would be a go-to team versus New England, but it's a little bit complicated because there's pretty heavy wins in Miami. So uh, you could get Waddle and Parker with Tua maybe. Uh but yeah, I don't know. What, what, you guys got any sleepers you're looking at? Yeah, where are you at, Kyle? 
I love the Kyle Pitts call. I didn't know that he had told, uh, and I did find this, he told reporters he's going to play, got an unlimited practice. Uh, you know, he's mostly only disappointed, which, uh, you know, if you go back to him every single week, it's the DJ Moore thing. Like the numbers look good on this guy. It's incredible that he doesn't get there. He can break the record too, by the way. This single yes, yeah, you're right. Tight end record. Yeah. So, uh, and I, does he, I assume he already has the, uh, the rookie receiving record. I'd imagine. No, that would be the, that's this week. He can break the rookie receiving yards. Uh, okay. Someone got over a thousand as a rookie. I don't know who that is. Very it was impressive. Mike Ditka. Jesus. I'm pretty Mike, sure you, you, you you're, can fact check me chat. Actually, no, I know Mike you're, Ditka. I know you're right. I've heard this on Twitter before. Yeah. I think it was uh, Ditka. players setting records in like, what was Ditka? Like the seventies is incredible. The fact that those things can still still stand. Uh, but yeah, like Pitts, I, I don't know if you call that motivation. Sure. It's motivation, but most importantly, he's like top five in air yards among tight ends, top 10 in targets that gives him a slate breaking potential. Unlike all but three or four tight ends. And because he's not very good every week from a fantasy perspective, no one ever wants to go back to him. But like, this is a game where at least his opponent has motivation. So it should be back and forth. If the Falcons can hold up their end of the bargain. I like Kyle Pitts, uh, but I've liked him every week and it rarely turns out. So well, whatever. Let me just say, I don't care what Pitts does this week. It's nonsense. Ditka did it in 1961 in a 14 game season and had uh, almost 1100 yards. Come on now. 61. Did they like most teams didn't even pass for a thousand yards in 61? I assume. I, I don't know, but 14 games. Oh, I mean, that's crazy. It's like the OJ Simpson 2000 yard season, right? That's what yeah, we all remember him for. <laughs> OJ said, uh, the, the running back, right? That's the, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, you should see him just slice through defenses. It was a, it was a sight to behold. All right, let's, uh, Let's close this one out. Oh, one more, one more thing, Alex, uh, both of you guys, because I did want to hit on the highest total game. I usually leave that to the end. Arizona and the Seahawks who won you a Millie. What do you make uh, of this game? And is this one where we should be looking to kind of get stacks in with Ertz or AJ Green and the running backs and, and the Seahawks coming off a big game? How do you guys approach this, Alex? And then you, Kyle. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, the Cardinals have a 27-point team total this week. That's third on the slate, so that's uh, that's huge. And then it depends a little bit on who's back. If John, James Conner happens to play, I think he's always a good GPP option because he gets all the goal line carries. But then if he's out, Chase Edmonds is going to look great. You can stack up Ertz or Kristen Kirk or A.J. Green with Kyler. I think fantastic plays. And then Seattle obviously uh, has 50 point upside, uh, real football <laughs> points. So uh, it's pretty tough to fade them. What about you, Kyle? Yeah, I think uh, Seattle has not made any mention of not playing with motivation. And like this is this appears to be a uh, a send off performance for someone. Do we know who yet? I don't <laughs> think so. But this will be a send off for you're one alluding of to either Pete Carroll or Russell Wilson. That is correct. It seems like, and Russell Wilson's comments are great. He's like, my goal is to win a Super Bowl. My plan is to win it with the Seahawks. Like he's clearly not, uh, not denying the fact that he would be fine leaving Seattle. It seems like, although this is, I uh, actually, it's the home game for them. Uh, no, it's an away game, but it does seem like at some point, one of these two has to go. They seem to be playing with motivation despite having none. And obviously Arizona is still live to win the NFC West and their targets are like, really easy to pin down. Like Zachary has 33 targets in the three most recent games without uh, DeAndre Hopkins. And beyond that, you're just like Christian Kirk, AJ Green. That's about it. Seattle's even more condensed. It's just two pass catchers. I say this every time they're underdogs and it rarely pans out, but if we can possibly get to 35, I know it's a crazy number, Pete, but 35 Russell Wilson attempts, it would make DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett very exciting. All right, let's close this out, fellas. It's time to do our Top fades, pivots, and favorite bet of the week. I got a bet I, I like quite a bit. Kyle, let's go to you first. Give me your top pivot, your or top fade, top uh, pivot, and top bet for week 18. Uh, fade will be Antonio Gibson, uh, only because I think he is probably fragile among the players. Like, I think Sony Michelle, the only real threat to him would be like Cam Akers, which would be absolutely stunning if like Cam Akers goes out and gets 10 carries. The real reason they activated him uh, for these final three weeks is because he needs three weeks on the active roster to like get his pension or something it is the rules for players in a crude season. So I don't think we see much of him. Sony Michelle's a three down back on a better team. I'd like, I'd pivot to him over Antonio Gibson who could be pulled for Jared Patterson and is already banged up uh, and bet you can find Ryan Tannehill's prop really low for passing yards for like 
a non Mike Glennon quarterback. I believe it's 205. It is. I saw that on Odd Shopper. It's low 200s. Yeah, I believe I, I have it pulled up on Odd Shopper. It's, it's 205 at points bet. Uh, yeah, 205 minus 125. Or if you want a little higher, 209 minus uh, 114 on FanDuel. Like, he, the last time he played in Houston, unsurprisingly, he buried them with over 300. I still believe on the year he's averaging more than, he's obviously averaging more than this number, and he's hit it more often than not. Sure, Houston gives up a ton of running plays, like bottom two or three in a pass percentage face because teams run against Houston, but their secondary is also terrible. And they actually have a few players in the COVID list as well, Justin Reed safety. So it seems like even if Tannehill doesn't get to attempt 35 passes, he could just bury them with efficiency. Love it. Uh, Alex, I had a quick question. It, do we have Saturday ownership up yet on another tab? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to post it on the main slate later today, but uh, it's on Fantasy Cruncher as well. Okay, cool. I think we do have like a Saturday ownership tab as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah, I got I it. Uh, let me flip that to the right. It's going to be so tables. hard to do that anyway. Yeah. I don't even know who's playing, but uh, I'll go with one that we talked about earlier. I'm not fading Jonathan Taylor. Like, I don't want any of them, but I do think, and all of us kind of came together, there are some good spots here, you know, at, at lower ownership. Uh, and I know our tools don't love him right now, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if Alvin Kamara had a huge game, but also Najee Harris. We, we kind of just, we talked through the, the passing the pass catching upside with Deontay Johnson out. They still have some chance. So I do like some of those, you know, upper mid range, lower high end running backs a lot that might be able to get you some other great receivers in there. Uh, and you're not sacrificing as much for Jonathan Taylor. Although I do like Taylor. I just like a lot, some of those running backs. So that would be my, my fade and pivot. And uh, Hey, I'm going to Rex Burkhead, baby. For the prop, he's got those incentives. He needs 103 total yards. It could be in the passing game or rushing game, but over 41 and a half rushing yards. I think that looks pretty good for a guy that is already getting a lot of work in the run game. He has 40, sorry, he has 56 carries over the last three weeks, 16 plus carries in three straight games. Yes, yards per attempt hasn't been great in two of three, but really, if I look at that and I say, okay, he just needs to average like, Less than three yards per carry on 16 or so attempts. I'll take that all day long. Uh, over at Odd Shopper, we have the best one on Rex Burkhead. Uh, over at Points Bet, 40 and a half now. We have him projected at 55.6 yards. You can find all this at Odd Shopper, totally free. Uh, expected ROIs, 27%, 71% expected win rate. Uh, and then say like you're on DraftKings, he's at 41 and a half. Uh, if you wanted to get that there, you're talking one yard. Although I'm always trying to get the best bet possible, which is why I use Odd Shopper to find it for me. Alex, close us out. What do you got, brother? Uh, my fade is uh, Brandon Cooks coming in at 12% ownership. I mean, I just think Houston's not that good. They're facing Tennessee, which uh, has an incentive to win. So um, the price and the ownership is too high. So I'm pivoting to Jacoby Myers and Russell Gage, who – both are in competitive games and uh, the ownership is lower and we have the chance of being the outcome all line up higher. The bets I'm betting Patrick Mahomes over 261 and a half. The weather in uh, Denver tomorrow, it's supposed to only have two, two mile an hour winds and 42 degrees. So pretty good conditions for passing must win game. And this is the, the highest uh, pass rate team in the league. Uh, or I mean, just double check. They're, they're uh, fourth highest. So I think uh, you're going to see a ton of passing volume and they're pretty efficient. Denver, Denver, also at, Denver without Ronald Darby and uh, Pat Sertain as well. I think Fangio said today that he doesn't think either are going to play. So they are like really running thin in their secondary. Yeah, that's not good. Um, <laughs> and that's a Saturday game, which means that we've got a Saturday strategy show coming up today. Neil Orfield, the, uh, the short slate and showdown killer himself. Got a lot of talk about killers over the past couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, he'll be with me at 2 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully, you guys will all hang out with us for Saturday strategy show, breaking down Chiefs, Broncos, and Philadelphia Eagles, Dallas Cowboys. This has been a blast as always. Kyle, man, fun closing out the uh, regular season with you, man. Appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I enjoy coming back. I enjoy people in the chat uh, still remembering me fondly, I hope. Uh, so always have me back anytime. Awesome. Alex, final thoughts before we head out for the rest of the regular season. Uh, yeah, guys, this is a week where you want to be reading all the, the tidbits and uh, we'll get you covered on, on Sunday. 
uh, Sunday morning, like uh, up to LAC with all the latest and uh, good luck this week. Catch you guys back here soon. Thanks for hanging out with us all season. We'll see you here on the contrary wild card weekend. But of course, everything culminates four and a half hours Sunday leading up to lock. Peace. 